Gentlemen, I am absolutely delighted to be here and very honored to have been asked to introduce Simon Schama. I was a history professor at the University of London. I am now a history professor at the University of Hong Kong. I'm not entirely sure all of you know what it means to live in the world of academia. It means struggling through endless articles and books written in bad English, in jargon, <laughs> in what is referred to as academies. A mountain of gobbledygook. Now, thank God. Thank God Britain has a long history of clear, gripping history writing. Before the Second World War, George Trevelyan was a born writer, natural storyteller, prolific author, whose books reached literally millions of people in Britain and beyond. He was a professor of history at the University of Cambridge and apparently only ever agreed to supervise one single student. His name was uh, John Plum, P-L-U-M. B, Sir John Plum. John Plum was devoted as well to clear history writing, but unlike Trevelyan, he became mentor of a great many very talented young historians. Two of his students were stellar. One of them was my very dear friend, Roy Porter, a one-man writing machine who made the history of medicine accessible to new audiences. He left us some 20 years ago at the very untimely age of 55. So thank God we have Simon Sharma with us today here in Jaipur. He's a distinguished historian, a university professor, a television writer, and a prolific a uh, columnist. He's a true star who has inspired many of us. His very first book was published in 1977, Patriots and Liberators. It received the very prestigious Wilson History Prize. Dozens of books followed. The one that captured me most, maybe because I'm Dutch, was on the Dutch Golden Age entitled The Embarrassment of Riches. It was published in 1987. It captured my imagination. I had just arrived in London to start a PhD in history. Many books followed on the French Revolution, on landscape and memory, on Rembrandt, on Caravaggio. Sir John Plum, his mentor, insisted that historians leave the ivory tower, and he himself set an example when he co-wrote a BBC television series on the royal family in the 1970s. Sir Simon himself became a household name in Britain and beyond when he wrote a BBC television series on the history of Britain to mark the millennium in the year 2000. Many other television series have followed as well as Emmy Awards. Today, he will talk to us about populism, nationalism and the fate of the world. Please join me in welcoming Simon Schama. Yeah, ah. the voice of history back again. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, happy Republic Day, everybody. Happy Republic Day. And it was wonderful to see that this morning on the lawn of our hotel, um, the Indian flag unfurling. And, and my wife just remarked before I came on stage that the most beautiful thing about it was that when the flag unfolded, it was already at the top of the mast, Rose petals, they were roses, weren't they? I think so, yeah. Anyway, flower petals dropped down 
Um, and it would be a wonderful thing if on all moments of national celebrations, we were all covered with roses, really. It doesn't necessarily always happen like that. But this morning, for Republic Day, the yogurt for breakfast was saffron, white, and green, as it should be. Everything was saffron, white, and green. I ought to be in saffron, white, and green, and I'm not. But, but this was a sort of lovely and beautiful thing. And I, what I want to talk about today, um, actually, is the time when things that we take for granted that express our sense of belonging to a, a tribe or a nation or a national community, a fatherland or a motherland, were invented. Flags and national anthems and a sense of having a national uniform for an army all were invented around the same time, between around 1750 and 1850. But I want to think really, again, just for a minute, um, out of a sense of respect and contemporary significance, all history is contemporary history, said one very great Italian historian, Benedetto Croce. And that actually is a feeling shared by everybody who actually began historical writing in Europe, in the Western tradition. Um, Thucydides, who wrote the great book on the Peloponnesian War was himself a participant in the war which he described. He was a general who didn't do well enough to avoid being sacked. But he also was a critic of the way Athens, his own army, his own culture, he was a critic of the way in which the war was being fought. So the honor, the moral dignity, the moral and ethical force of history has been to be a pain in the side of those who are in power. That's our job, is to keep the powerful awake, to be a kind of critical discipline, not necessarily being uh, sycophantically obliging for those in power. History, Frank, I think will agree with me. It's his subject rather than mine. I don't want to steal it. History really is done to make dictators feel uneasy. It's certainly not done as an act of idle national self-congratulation. But this day, Republic Day, is particularly important. I don't know what, I'm not telling you this, I've learned this, in that it's a celebration not just of being Indian, but a celebration of the Constitution, and not just of the writing of the Constitution, but of the adoption of the Constitution. Yes, and this is it, exactly, you're applauding, applaud away. And this has inc become incredibly important, but also incredibly problematic in a way, because there are these two senses, actually, of how you actually express your sense of belonging to a country. On the one hand, there are constitutions. The American Constitution, for example, Britain does not have a constitution. A lot of discussion in Britain about it, whether it should have, particularly in the light of the, the very vexed and bitter debates over Brexit, about which a little bit more in a minute. But constitutions ever since the first one in France in 1789 and then in 1791 were written by intellectuals and politicians and those who felt who claimed to have the ear of the people. And, you know, so it... it it necessarily, necessarily is. And part of the debate you're having in India now, in a very intense way, is whether or not the CAA is in keeping with the constitution, the original constitution of India, as a secular state or not. There is a similar debate in another country I love and feel part of for all its many faults, and that's Israel. The Israeli Declaration of Independence, which was a kind of preamble constitution, the very early first draft of a constitution, promised full civic and political and social rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or gender. And in last year, I think it was, it was in fact the so-called basic law passed by the Knesset in effect decisively changed the emphasis of the original Declaration of Independence to, to make national rights, essentially the rights exclusively of the Jewish people. I'm Jewish myself, but I was very unhappy to see that. It continued to guarantee 
civic rights to all the residents of Israel, but not necessarily national, for which we read citizenship rights, political rights, to all the residents of Israel. So you can see, dear ladies and gentlemen, you can see if we join these dots, the tension between a constitutional definition of political belonging to a country and something else, the something else I'm going to be talking about for the rest of my remarks, a visceral, emotional, um, almost irrational, almost church-like devotion to what your country is. Those two things are coming very often from one end of the world to the other in sharp and not necessarily harmonious relief. Which brings me to two other events that have happened. One is about to happen in five days' time, in which the second kind of nationalism, a nationalism of feeling, of folk union, is happening in my, one of the countries I live in, in the not very United Kingdom, Brexit, which will be celebrated by a large number of people in Britain as the reassertion of what it really means to be British. In fact, if it's a celebration at all, and those of you who read me in the newspaper in the Financial Times will not be surprised to hear that I don't think it's a celebration. I think it's a moment of horrific grief, mourning, sorrow, contraction, and wretched misery. It's an act of horrible separation. Some Remainers, some wonderful Remainers, as I would predict there would be in the front row. But it's not even a celebration of all of the United Kingdom. Scotland, for example, has a large majority that both in, a re in, in two elections now um, have elected by very large majority the Scot Scottish National Party, which is not in favor of Brexit at all. A majority of those living in Northern Ireland are also against leaving the European Union. So the Scots are in effect being told they are leaving the European Union more or less coercively. It's up to them to try and decide if they want to have their own independent referendum. Boris Johnson has actually just ruled that out, but it may not be in his, ultimately, by what power and by what authority does he claim to rule that out? Last night was Burns Night, and Robert Burns himself was somebody who more or less reinvents Scottish patriotism, even while he's working for the British government. And doing this, this is a dangerous moment for everybody. On Burns Night, many things happen. People drink a lot of whiskey, that's good. Eat a lot of haggis, strange food, which I actually happen to like. Anyone been in Scotland lately? There's something, did you actually manage to eat? Haggis lollipops, you say, not on your life. How many Scots in the audience were you saying, um, you're kidding, there are no Scotties here? Uh-oh, I should have you. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I apologize to the gentleman and lady of there about what I'm about to do, actually. Because on Burns Night, you all think of Robert Burns, or some of you think of Robert Burns and Old Lang Syne, just going around the world as his most famous and favorite tune, but actually the tune which is most moving and which is sung by the fiercer Scots, which was um, written by Burns and set to a much older song, uh, allegedly uh, sung by the soldiers of Robert the Bruce, who uh, defeated the English at Bannockburn. It's called Scots Wahe, which means Scots with whom. And um, it goes like this. And don't panic or try and leave en masse, because I'm about to sing. So hence the apologies. Scots, why we Wallace bled. Scots, when Bruce uh, often led. Welcome to your gory bed, or oh, to victory. Uh, this is a song really about Scottish memory, written at the end of the 18th century when the Scottish-English Union was deep but in trouble. There were actually riots um, because there was a lot of enthusiasm for the French Revolution in Scotland at the time. There were riots, arrests, and trials. So Burns, even though he was in the pay of the English government, decided to actually write a song which was unapologetically in what he called the Scots dialect. The cunning of the song is that it's half in English and half in Scots. But it goes on 
in this gloriously incendiary way. Now's the day and now's the hour. See the front of battle hour. See approach proud Edward's power. That's a king a long time ago. Chains and slavery. I'm skipping a bit because otherwise you really will rush for the door. By oppressions, woes, and pains, by your sons in servile chains, we will drain our dearest veins, but they shall be free. This is a call to battle. Lay the proud compose usurpers low, tyrants fall in every foe, liberties in every bow, let us do or die. That's let us do or die. I'm expecting applause, I say. <laughs> but, but I'm not auditioning anytime soon <laughs> for Scottish musicals. So there are a lot of things in Burns's gorgeous song. There is what I call the romance of defeat. As a looking back to a Scottish victory at Bannockburn, a looking back, the first lines of Scots were hey, Scots were hey, we Wallace bled. Those of us who bled, who bled our lives away on the field for William Wallace, which was a defeat. And the sense that somehow you can actually reclaim your national identity through language, through language above all. And that was a kind of very important thing that, that happened and still does happen and is, has a great amount of potency, I think, in, in politics and history. So there was actually a time, we, we now all kind of take it for granted, that nationalism, particularly a populist kind of nationalism, is pretty much paramount, paramount, whether we're talking about Narendra Modi's definition of what India is or Donald Trump's definition of what America is. The, the, the great kind of paramountcy which national obsessions enjoy really belongs to two of the great problems that are afflicting or besetting us in the 21st century. What are they? Well, the overwhelming problem that we're all facing is the slow collapse, the slow decay of a sustainable earth. That's for sure. But the second problem is this, a division between those who essentially want to live in a country or a city or a neighborhood just with people who look, sound, pray, cook like them, who want to live in a homogeneous country. And both the Constitution of India and the Constitution of Israel took a different view. They took the view of actually having a country where we can share the neighborhood, essentially. That we don't see the sharing neighborhood with those who do not look, do not have the same skin color, do not pray to the same God, who do not cook the same way, who do not speak the same language, is something that can happen. And that generally happens in, in great cities, like the two cities that are closest to my heart where I live in New York um, and, and London. So much of the nationalist fury against so-called cosmopolitans, against neighborhood which has shared, wanting a country to be re reborn in an imagined fantasy of a homogeneous country, comes very often from the countryside and small town rage against whatever it is in the great metropolitan cities that they feel has taken something away from them. Nationalism, populist nationalism, if you listen to Donald Trump's first election camp speechy, speeches, always depends on a sense of loss. Someone has taken something away from us, especially immigrants. It's the same with Brexit, isn't it? Immigrants are said in the language of Brexit to have taken our jobs, taken our wages, taken our fish, taken our industries. None of that is true. None of that is true. It's all a huge pack of lies in the British case. All the things that were wrong with Rust Belt America, with Northern and Midlands, were wrong because British governments made them wrong, not because the EU had any responsibility. But it's much easier to say the outsiders, them, the globalizers, George Soros, they took your country and you're living away from you. That is actually the kind of sense of anger about theft on which nationalist populism and authoritarianism feeds. So we see this happening from one end of the world to the other. There was a time, I have to say, when this 
was a huge, would have been a huge surprise. Take you back to 1950 something, when I was a kid in school in London. Um, 19, I, I kind of think it was 1957 or 1958, a long time ago, more than half a century ago. And I'm sitting in the schoolroom, and um, you know, it's a time really where a lot of London was still in ruins. My father used to come and work. Um, and uh, when I was a very small child, I'd live by the seaside, and he would take me into the city, and we'd, we'd walk through blackened so ruins, the city of London, with all its skyscrapers and not being rebuilt, the sense of what the war had wrought. And we thought, when we said what the war had wrought, we thought almost of one continuous war, which went from 1914 all the way through, in a way, to, to 1945, the Second World War almost being a consequence of, of the first. So I'm sitting in school and a brilliant history teacher called Robert Irvin Smith, who looked very much like Oudon's bust of Voltaire. He had the same smile, that smile, pointy chin. And Robert said, and he, he was someone who made, I was very lucky in my history teachers. He said, well, boys, and we were all boys. He said, we don't know what the rest of the 20th century holds, but we know this for sure. Organized religion and nationalism are dead as dodos, are things of the past. So much for the prophetic powers of history. And we all thought that. We all thought that not because we thought that the fires of nationalism had really burnt themselves out in the Second World War um, and all the catastrophes that it had brought, including the Holocaust. But we thought that was it. Also, because of the founding of the United Nations, events that seemed absolutely miraculous, the reconciliation between France and Germany, which set up the iron and steel co uh, community, which became the e uh, eventually turned into the uh, common market and eventually into the EU. Um, the, the Atlantic Charter of Roosevelt, and then even in a less optimistic mode, um, something we didn't like, the Cold War. If there was going to be a mutually exterminating conflict, it seemed to us as though it, we, were, we were sucked into a kind of war b between totalitarianism and American capitalism in which the old sense of romance of nationhood was completely irrelevant. And so it seemed for a very long time, and so it seemed even when the Soviet Union fell, fell apart during 1989. And I... Fast forward to the summer of 1989, a joyous moment, we all thought, really. Um, the first quasi-democratic elected body uh, of uh, what had been the Soviet Union was, was elected in 1989. Um, Lech Wałęsa led a kind of triumphant solidarity movement to be part of the leading part of a democratically elected Polish government in 1989. There was a huge dark cloud a catastrophe in, in 1989, namely, of course, Tiananmen Square. But by and large, everything seemed to be going the way of a kind of happy future for the fate of liberal democracy. And then on a day at the very end of June, I think it was June the 30th, it was certainly that week, um, I was living, we, my wife and I and our small children were living in Massachusetts. I was teaching at Harvard University. And I was going to pick up my two small children from daycare. And um, a bulletin came over public radio, national public radio, about a place I hadn't heard of called Kosovo. And a name I hadn't heard of. Uh, and the name was Sloboda Milosevic. And what the report was saying was so profoundly disturbing, so kind of shocking. I think only shocking. It's going to seem very small potatoes to you all now. You all go, duh, of course. But it was, it was in the, that atmosphere of unearned euphoria about what the future had to hold. It was very shocking to me. The report was simply, it wasn't of a battle, it wasn't of a massacre. It was of a speech. It was a speech given by Milosevic on the 28th of June, 1989. So maybe two, two days earlier at a place called Gazimastan, just outside Pristina, which is the capital of Kosovo now and very close to a battlefield, a medieval battlefield, called the Field of Blackbirds, um, at near Kosovo Polier. The Field of Blackbirds was a battle in, this was to commemorate the 
600th anniversary of this enormous battle, a battle fought between the Serbian prince, so-called Tsar Lazar, and the Ottoman Sultan Murad I. Both Lazar and Murad actually had been killed on the battlefield. And the way the Serbs have remembered it, by which we mean the way romantic poets in the 1700s and the early 19th century, especially the latter remembered it, was as a huge Serb defeat. This is really odd because it was a kind of standoff. But the defeat was a kind of wound, a wound which would never, ever heal. And in the days... Be so what was Milosevic? Milosevic, of course, you'll know, was a communist apparatchik. He was a member of the bureaucracy. He'd been a communist overseer of a gas and oil industry. It was extraordinary. He was a complete mediocrity, a nobody. But he had a kind of nose for something. And that something was national memory, a way to get out from under the wreckage of Soviet disaster, the nomenclatura, and fight those ancient battles over and over again. A way to find a way to be an, a national hero to the Serbs. He was often called Little Lazar in this propaganda war that he was fighting in the 1980s. So he had thought to create this extraordinary event which bust in one million Serbs from all over Serbia to this field, the field of blackbirds. You can actually go on YouTube and actually see this extraordinary speech which went on for a long time in broad sunlight. And the reason why, why I was shocked really was in a way a backhand compliment in a, in a ghastly way to Milosevic's cleverness. He'd found a way actually to stir up, to sort of boil up the juices of national feeling. In 1974, the constitution of what was then Yugoslavia, and then it was even more important after, after Marshal Tito died in 1980, had essentially been based on the autonomy of the several states that made up the old Yugoslavia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Slovenia, etc. Kosovo itself was not one of those equal states, but it had been given autonomy. That was very important. 90% of the population of Kosovo were and are Albanian, with 10% minority of Serbia. So on that day, on the 28th of June, 1989, Milosevic came to give this speech at the Field of Blackbirds, greeted by the media in Serbia, saying we are now once again living in the time of Kosovo. To, to actually say essentially, you belong to greater Serbia. You belong to something bigger than yourself. Milosevic had a remark, which he didn't make at the speech, but it was, um, it was, it was attributed to him in the newspapers, which had been taken over by the Serbian press, to say, as long as, as, long as one Serb is alive in Kosovo, Kosovo is our heart and soul. Kosovo will always be Serbian. Always be Serbian. And in the days, and, and actually that was even modified a bit later on to say, as long as any Serb is buried, any Serb is buried in Kosovo, Kosovo will always be Serbian. It, it, the whole thing was quite extraordinary. The remain, body remains of the Serbian prince who died on the field of blackbirds. The original Tsar Azar were found in churches in Serbia, in Kosovo, excuse me, and were paraded around for two weeks before this actual extraordinary moment. And the reason why it was stirred up, as I say, was I thought something which I thought it was like kind of some zombie, some ghost that actually had levered open the tomb of history and was walking around saying, I am the future, not your sunshiny shared brotherhood of liberal plural democracy. I meaning that definition of nationhood, of one Serbia. Remember, a big religious difference because the battle at Kosovo was, of course, a battle between Christianity and Islam as well. That had long been forgotten in a way, but Milosevic and those who supported him made sure it was remembered. And it is still being spoken of in that way by people like Viktor Orban and the Polish Law and Justice Party, that those national parties which have a profoundly shrunken version 
of what the fit between democracy and nationalism is are essentially defending some idea of Christian Europe against oncoming hordes of immigrants who might or might not be Muslim. So this was really an, in, an absolutely enormous shake-up. And there is this, you know, it presupposes that part of Milosevic's wicked genius, really, and, uh, you know, he was responsible for terrible things that happened. The whole autonomy, basically, Kosovo became an occupied country. Independent universities were shut down. It became forbidden to actually teach either in school or in university in Albania. And an astonishing actual thing happened in Kosovo itself. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's profoundly moving. People talk about it all the time. Kosovo, Albania and Kosovo, managed to develop a parallel life. Schools carried on teaching in Albania in private homes and houses. There was an unofficial university also in private homes and houses. There were cafes, really, which continued to show arts and read poetry in Albania. And they were only not attacked by, in effect, the occupying Serbian police because American diplomats like Richard Holbrook would go there. Even so, nonetheless, there came a point where the Serbian police were now in the middle of the 1990s just actually smashed their way into the cafe and shot everyone in sight. And the two owners, the husband and wife, who I spoke to when I was in Kosovo in September, still walk around with their bodies full of shrapnel, actually, as a result of that. This is a living war. It was a European war. And it actually, you know, it came to pass because us intellectuals were too stupid or too high-minded to understand, actually, the emotional force of what nationalism is. And there's a difference, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is a sense of belonging to a community which is kind of broad-minded. Robert Burns, who, I apologize again, I sang to you, was someone who worked perfectly well with the English government while actually developing what you might call cultural nationalism through his poetry and through his music. The other nationalism, and the nationalism which depends on, on ejecting those who don't fit the template. Donald Trump needs those immigrants who speak may, as their first language, maybe speak Spanish and therefore characterized collectively as murderers and rapists and nobody could ever fit into. And he's, he can succeed in that so far that he can separate small children from their, from their families. Two very different faces to nationalism. But if we want to actually deal with nationalism and see how it might or might not fit into a democratic community, you have to give it its due. It's no good just saying it's a corrupt, malignant, artificial thing. It's not. It's not. And um, it's not quite true to say that nationalism, even though I've said it about half an hour ago, was created in the romantic period of the, of the um, late 18th and early 19th century. Frank knows very well that a, an example of patriotism occurs during the long war that the Dutch have against the Spanish. And you, there, there are certain things during the time of the Reformation and the, and the century that followed, the, the interest in maps, for example, the interest in recovering the history of your own particular patch of earth, the feeling that you get actually from talking about a fatherland, really, all of which are part of what it means to belong to a nation. But it does undergo a kind of emotional sea change in the 18th century. And, um, and I'm not going to go along. I, I, people I spoke to, they said, well, what are you going to talk about this afternoon? I said, oh, 18th century German philosophy. I think that's what everyone wants to hear on a hot day. Don't panic again. It's not even worse than me singing. But there is one particular German philosopher called Johann Gottfried Herder, who, who was an extraordinary philosopher in, in lots and lots of ways. But for the purpose of what I want to say this afternoon, he was essentially a historian, one of his great things was being a historian of language. And Herder was really one of the earliest, and I think for, for many generations, the most influential of those who said, really, it'd be very nice if we were all the same through time and everywhere in London and New York and Jaipur, but the fact of human life is we are actually not. Language actually makes us different, 
the feeling we have for our own physical landscape and topography makes us different. We change from generation to generation. David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, another philosopher, Scottish philosopher, famously said, oh, I think really people are basically the same over time in places, and therefore history is kind of pointless to study, even though David Hume wrote a lot of history himself, because nothing very much changes under the sun. Sorrow is sorrow if an ancient Roman says it's sorrow is sorrow if uh, 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 somebody who owns a tavern in London or in Glasgow. Uh, and Helder took exception with that. He was someone who wasn't a German supremacist. He was someone who was extraordinarily learned in 11 languages, including Icelandic and some of the more obscure Caucasian language. But he did think language was formative in the way, way we feel about the community to which we belong. He distinguished rather wonderfully between what he called Kunstpoesy and Naturpoesy. Kunstpoesy is the poetry that we inherit from those who practice poetry um, traditionally, um, high, in a high-minded way. And they themselves go all the way back to Latin poetry and before Latin poetry, Greek pastoral poetry of the kind written by Theocritus and so on, the poetry of Milton and, and that sort of thing. Natur poesy was the, the rhymes we sing to our children, what we imbibe, what we hear from our mother when she sings a lullaby. And as the word suggests, Nature poetry belongs to a particular pace and a particular, a particular time as well. And um, Helder was responsible, and those who admired and followed him, like the brothers Grimm, um, like the writers Arnim and Brentano, really like Robert Burns in Scotland, saw that, saw that the secret, uh, some sort of secret language had been preserved in villages. Fairy stories, for example, the Grimm brothers sent a battalion of researchers out into the countryside to actually say, listen to what old ladies at spinning wheels tell you of the legends and stories of their remote ancestors. And the early 19th century saw an enormous kind of collection of those stories and ballads and poems and songs. And other things developed in the, the idea of what it meant to be a nationalist. The NAT part is really important. It means that you're being true to your human nature by feeling something particular about being in Rajasthan or being, being in the Highlands or belonging to New England in America. And nation, of course, etymologically comes from birth, from a nativity, from something that you actually have from your, from your homeland. It means the idea of a homeland Nationalism also depended, how am I doing? Oh dear, I'm going to wind up soon, I promise. Nationalism depended also on nostalgia. Um, a beloved, brilliant friend of mine called Svetlana Boim, um, a Russian expatriate who I met at Harvard and who died much too young a few years ago, wrote an absolutely wonderful book, I can't recommend it to you too highly, called The Future of Nostalgia. And Svetlana um, found for me, she wasn't the first to do so, but it was news to me, that nostalgia was first diagnosed as a disease, a clinical disease, by a Swiss doctor at the end of the 1600s called Johannes Hofer, who noticed that Swiss mercenary soldiers were so physically devastated by being separated from their Alpine homeland that they were unable to carry out their duties as mercenary soldiers whether they are standing guard over the king's bedroom at Versailles or looking after the Pope in Rome. And soldiers who actually, who suffered from nostalgia, were ordered to keep away from, you know, things like cheese and alpine music and horns and, and told to be sent back to Switzerland for a kind of repatriation so that they would get rid of the disease. The Russians themselves started to suffer from epidemics of nostalgia when Russian soldiers were were, were billeted in Central Europe, until one general said, well, if you're suffering from nostalgia, um, I have a cure for that. We can bring lots of Russian earth in a wagon, and we can bury you alive in it while you're on campaign. And that, <laughs> that got rid of the problem quite quickly, we're told. So all these things sort of feed, fed into the kind of response, the emotional response. And you think about actually what gets us going, 
you know, the roar of adulatory applause when things go right for your cricket side, or in, 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 in the case of uh, a Brit football, which very seldom happens, the sort of sense there of sport, physique, landscape, song, rhyming chants, all of those come together, and they're not a little thing. They're a huge thing in our life, an entire kind of corpus of music, of course. Think of Smetana in particular, um, you know, all kinds of composers, Wagner's own um, extraordinary kind of diapasons to the German past in Meistersingers, all of those become an immensely important part in the life of culture and still do. So once one's accepted that actually nationalism in this kind of form is a living thing, that it has a psychological reality to which we deeply and psychically respond, maybe we're better off equipped in some ways to make that distinction between the kind of nasty nationalism which depends on scapegoating large parts of the population and a sense of patriotic pride. And in any case, I think, and I want to kind of finish on, the, on this note, then in the end, really, you know, we may be living through a moment um, of, of nationalist, populist euphoria, of America first, of chess beating. You know, I'm a guest in your country. You know the equivalent that's happening now in India, of course. Um, but actually, the other problem facing the world, which I mentioned at the beginning of remarks, the problem of the the gradual collapse of a sustainable ecosystem, climate change and global warming. There's nothing that individual countries or individual nations have to say to that, which is gonna cure it. By definition, even if the Paris Climate Agreement is in very bad shape because you know Donald Trump walked out of it and he refuses to acknowledge, really, that there is climate change, keeps on calling it weather, and seems to be obsessed with the amount of water that dishwashers disperse. Ultimately, that depends. We all, we all live together on one earth, our ultimate extended family, our ultimate progeny of our earthling nativity, or we die together. So on that cheerful note, I'll end and I'll take some questions from you. I'll come and sit down. Uh, yeah. It does work. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a session sponsored by uh, the Rajasthan Patrika, and there is a prize to be won. And the prize will go to the person whose question I will read out right now for Simon to answer. And the question here is by Nitish Kumar Rajasthan Patrika. Sorry, there's Nitish Kumar for the Rajasthan Patrika contest. So he's the winner of this prize, and his question is, considering learnings from our past, what meaningful resolution should India take for 2020? <laughs> yeah, well, this is, I, I got myself, the other time I was in Jaipur, um, I got myself in, I don't know how many years ago, and if you only saw me disgrace myself, you know, um, <laughs> he was out on the lawn there, and um, uh, I, I um, some, I, I didn't know who Darka Butt was, and she seemed very clever, very opinionated, and I disagreed profoundly with whatever it was she was saying, and I'm ashamed to say I've forgotten about it now, and I actually interrupted her, which I realized was a kind of violation of religious law, actually, in, in the world of Indian media, and she was very upset, but she was very nice afterwards. So I'm very, I'm, I'm extremely, um, you know, uh, trying to be careful about really the way I respond to about what history can tell us um, about India's future or India's present in 2020. All I can say is that I did Indian history actually as an undergraduate in Cambridge in the, in the 1960s. The, 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 the beginning of the Raj, the sort of Indian and British history, that uh, bloody story that, that my friend Willie Dalrymple has told so brilliantly. Um, but what actually impressed me then, and when I filmed Indian art, particular Mughal miniatures 
for civilizations a couple of years ago was thinking again back to Akbar, essentially. Um, and there are, there are wonderful, both Akbar, Akbar was adamant, as you all know, that even though essentially this is going to be an Islamic empire, that all the religions of India, particularly Hinduism, would be sustained under Mughal rule. And there is actually an absolutely beautiful picture, a portrait of Jahangir, in, um, it, which is in Washington, um, which, which we fixated on because it has all sorts of European as well as Mughal influences in it. But it was made by a Hindu painter who actually represents himself in a corner of the painting in a saffron robe. So that picture in which it was possible, admittedly, you know, with a Mughal emperor who actually, the court language and the official language of which was Persian, um, and the style of very much of that art was inherited from, from Persia, um, was to me a kind of extraordinary moment. And one doesn't ever want to be very starry-eyed about the past and think it was all mutually tolerant, and it certainly wasn't battle-free. But actually, that notion of what India was, was indeed the India which was again inscribed into the constitution that we're celebrating today. How's that for a disgracefully ingratiating answer, you know? For <laughs> but Thank it's true, well. I feel it sincerely. I, I, would just, I would just add something that what Akbar and Jahangir did, and um, particularly Akbar represented, was happening in India at a time when Europeans, by the hundreds of thousands, were slitting each other's throats over wars of religion. Europe was grotesquely atavistic and barbaric and intent on the impossibility of Catholics and Protestants, never mind Jews, ever living together. So India should indeed pat itself on the back. So the lesson from that is India in 2020 can sort of take a lesson from India in 1620. I think we have time for maybe one quick question and a short answer. I can't see who has a microphone right here. So maybe right, the lady right, um, right over there. A very short question, please. Do you think that the future of the EU will become more nationalistic? Um, oh, was an incredibly good question. You know, will it become more nationalistic? It's become much more nationalistic, of course, actually. Um, but interestingly, whenever polls are taken in the countries we think of as most nationalistic, Italy, for example, um, or Poland, a huge majority, when asked whether or not they want to leave the EU, and this may just be for economically pragmatic reasons, there are gigantic majorities against leaving. I'm not saying you'll necessarily stay that way. Frank may have something to say about the Netherlands in that way, but there's no sign. You know, that's a sense, actually, a lot of the kind of nationalist fury about Brussels, whatever Brussels is supposed to stand for, um, is actually... In, in some sense sponged up in domestic politics rather than actually threatening to break the EU apart. What is a threat much more are two, and, and is a serious problem is actually not a nationalist problem, it's a, it's a constitutional political problem. The EU is supposed to stand because of the European Court of Justice for independent, uh, independent judiciary and uncensored freedom of press. And Viktor Orban, in particular in Hungary, this is also true of the Law and Justice Party in Poland, say, you know, this is not something we all need to obey. It's pretty much what Xi Jinping says in China, too. There's nothing sacred about your version of democracy. You know, if we manage to give you the wherewithal to buy a new washing machine for Christmas, how much do people really care about the Constitution? That is the bet that Donald Trump is making, too. How much do people really care about that old document. And that, that, you know, that particular question in America, as well as the EU, in America is tearing the country apart. If, there was, if, if really America deeply cared about the sanctity of the Constitution, Donald Trump would be convicted in the impeachment trial, whereas he will be acquitted. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in thanking Simon Schlammer for a, a riveting overview. We 
wish to thank Simon Sharma and Frank DeCotta, along with our sponsor Rajasthan Patrika, the leadership series for the very enriching and gripping session. Do note that the authors will be available to sign their books at the book signing desk. It's located right at the entrance, right at the front, right at the entrance of Charbagh. The next session at Charbagh is session 158, Art Without Frontiers, Classical Dance and Music of India. It will begin shortly.